please take a seat. We are going to start with the next. Next. ¿Por qué digo la T antes de la X? <laughs> so we are going to start with the next session, the round table. And before giving the floor to the people that are invited to participate in this, sec in this session, I just wanted to introduce... I had prepared a slide, but they don't find it. Just to let you know that the subject of this round table is about the global change and the possibility of the future to be open or not. We have a lot of data, we have a lot of experience, we have a lot of different points of view on this, and this is a, a subject that is very, very long, very large, very deep, and it's impossible to summarize everything in just a one hour time. We would like, but it's impossible. The idea is that we have a beautiful panel with four people, Miguel Delibes, that has already shown one small part of his expertise in social objective, looking at these kind of things together with data, beliefs, relationships, interests. Everything that he summarized in the last uh, slide was completely applicable directly to the global change. So I think his contribution will be very interesting in this uh, round table. Together with him, we have Delphine Grivet here. Uh, she's a researcher in the EC4, the um, Forest Science Institute, depending now from the CSIC, and her speciality is in adaptation, genetics, gen population genetics, and evolution. Thank you, Delphine. We also have Mercedes Guijarro, which is also in the same institute for forest science in Madrid. And she is now also the president of the um, Spanish Society for Forest Science from the summer. So thank you, Mercedes. Her speciality is about uh, forest fires, but not just uh, it burns, what can we do with that, but in a very larger way, more deep and more um, integrated. Thank you, Mercedes. We also have Clara Anton, who is a researcher in our U4, in our institute, and uh, she has a very large expertise also in modelizing and in projecting the data in the future, which is something that we have to do for many, many points, but especially for global change, uh, because we have different scopes and different scenarios that can be possible. Uh, she also has a large experience in Norway, we were talking a few minutes ago about the different perceptions of things from different countries. She has the largest expertise in that. And to organize all this debate, we have Luis Quevedo. I'm not Luis Quevedo. He will be here in a few <laughs> minutes. And he, he, he's a journalist. Well, he's working as a journalist, but his background is in biotechnology. So I think he's the person to mix together uh, what do we do with our data? How can we communicate that? And which are the points that we can improve? And he has a very, very large, long, deep experience in dissemination, both in the United States and in Spain. And so uh, we are, it's an honor for us to have him uh, today with us. And uh, I hope, I'm sure, you will enjoy this uh, round table. Thank you all the presenters and Luis for your participation in this. Well, thank you, Elena, and all the public and the students and researchers assisting here today. It is an honor to be here with you sharing. Um, uh, also, I, I'm not only just a brief uh, bio sketch because I've been a biotechnologist and then a, a journalist of sorts, but I'm actually today representing FECIT, and FECIT is the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. It's a public institution under the Spanish Ministry of Science science and innovation, sorry, um, that works for scientists and society at large, uh, as we'd like to say, as a catalyst of sorts. Uh, we, we foster the essential chemistry that uh, connecting science, technology, innovation to all citizens at large, um, hopefully pushes forward our country closer to a more sustainable, diverse, democratic, and frankly, more scientifically literate future. 
Uh, as I was saying, it, it is an honor to, to kickstart this roundtable with these four uh, wonderful researchers. Um, and although we have these amazing four uh, researchers, we'd like to, for it to be an open discussion. So we've got a microphone there. So uh, excuse us for five minutes, an opening round. But after that, please feel free. I, I actually encourage you to participate. So please just raise your hand, get the mic, and get it on. Um, Alrighty, that's uh, as far as it goes for introductions. Let's start. Now, we've got almost an hour. Um, can I start by sending you an, an open question? And whomever wants can, can start. Um, this is a, a general opening question. Um, what, what would you say that is or are, depending on how generous you, you'd like to be, the most urgent challenges uh, related to global change from your specific perspective? Um, um, who wants to start? <laughs> Clara, <laughs> go. It, it's, a, it's a sort of a summary of sorts. Let's go short for the beginning, yeah. Um, so, as Elena uh, introduced me, I'm a forest mall herder. Um, I work mostly in Norway, where we have probably uh, feeling climate change the fastest and the strongest. Uh, so, we see our uh, forests grow better, and we are all happy, especially in Norway. It is getting warmer and wetter, so trees are super happy, right? <laughs> they grow nice and fastly. But where we're missing, and I think that's, that's the next step, is that there's other things not so nice happening like uh, increased droughts, which we're not used to. I mean, there, two weeks, no rain, it's drought, like real drought. Um, so now we are, we are seeing things that we haven't seen before. And uh, there is also things that we see coming from countries nearby, like Sweden and Central Europe, like bark beetles, which are also very hi highly affected by climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these things, when we model, are not usually included. So we model the nice part, but we don't, we don't know how, I think, still how to take into account that the risks are increasing and that our future forests might not look so nice and that we might have to do things differently to decrease this risk. And I'm talking uh, wind throws, uh, bark beetle, and forest fires. So we see the nice things, we can model them, we basically, we cannot not model them, but we are not able, to, we don't, we're starting to think about the risk, the increases, uh, the increasing risks uh, from, uh, from, like them, from climate change. All right. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll follow on that later. Delphine, what would you say? Okay. Uh, I think from my field, so the genetic part, uh, one of the main challenge is to understand how this uh, climatic change is affecting the populations of trees. How the population will respond to these changes? I mean, we know that climate, the, the trees have been through, and human, all the human and animals, have been doing through different glacial cycles in the past. And so we know they can adapt, but the problem is that not this, this climatic changes, they are accelerating. And I mean, some, some are due to human activities and we, know, we want to know how these populations will answer to these changes. And I think that's the challenge that we are facing right now. All right, thank you. Miguel, you, you wanted to catch her? Okay, uh, the question is really difficult because the, there are many challenges, uh, particularly regarding wildlife, and we could discuss a lot about the impact of climate change on wildlife species, but I'm going to move to, to people because I was talking about people during my presentation, and uh, one of the biggest challenges is just reconnect, reconnecting people with nature. As I said in one of my responses, now people don't know very well how nature works now because we are disconnected. And this uh, makes more difficult uh, taking some decisions very important, for example, the control of inv invasive species, which are one of the main drivers of uh, biodiversity loss, is often difficult because people is against this population control. And this is very influenced by the fact that people are disconnected with nature. So mm, I would say that mm, this uh, reconnection with nature would be one of the biggest challenges just to at least to manage uh, wildlife. 
All right. Thank you. And Mercedes, last but not least. Yes. Oh. I think. I mean, you got two. One, one, one's got to work. Thank you. Sorry. There you are. Uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, Forest Fire, who is my uh, my uh, my topic, uh, is clearly connected with uh, with global global change, not only uh, climate change but also global because it's, it's linked with the change in the land uses and uh, and also with uh, with climate. So we we need to, we have challenges uh, re related with with people who live in the uh, in the territory and also with. Uh, uh, with fire and uh, fire from the point of view of prevention of uh, fire behavior and uh, restoration after after fire, so it's a there are a lot of challenges. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, let me let me sorry let me reposition this. That's it. So, uh, Clara, you, you you were saying that that you are, if I understood correctly, this this is for Clara, uh, that that you uh, take into account the nicer things of life, but not so much the not so nice things of life. Why is that? And 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 what options do you have to sort of try and start tackling that that problem? Yeah, well, so we take the nice parts because they are easy to see, right? Right. They grow better. They grow yeah. better in like in 10 years, you can see, you, you can see the, the graphs. I work for the National Forest Inventory in Norway, mm -hmm. right? So we have data. So it was like this, and then from 1990, it's like the slope changes just, it's, it's very straightforward to see. And then it's easy to model. It also, for, for example, climate change is positive for us to grow better because we capture more CO2, so it's easy to sell. Uh, the, the risk part is much more challenging because it doesn't happen that bark beetles suddenly start to be just, you know, grow bigger. So it's just like it waits, it waits until it comes and something huge happens. And then everybody wants you to model bark beetles and do something about it right now. It's like uh, we haven't planned. I don't know. I, can, I don't know how to calculate the risks. Risks are, are much harder to, to uh, model and to see and to introduce in, in your decision making than there are things like it grows better. Mm -hmm. um, but, but is that something? Um, is this something that um, you you think that it's being communicated enough, or that uh, you know stakeholders or yeah. politicians sort of understand that that you you are facing this challenge? For Norway, it hasn't happened yet. All right. So everybody's like, yeah, it happens to Sweden, it happens to Germany. We are, we are going to, you know, we are still safe. Right, so like right. It's, it's Germany, it, uh, they start to worry when out, uh, bark beetle uh, outbreaks uh, completely decimated. They are uh, one of the most productive uh, forests. Mm -hmm. In Norway, it hasn't happened, no, wind, no big windstorms yet, no big fires yet, no bark beetle outbreaks yet, so there is no, people doesn't feel the threat so much. So, so interesting, so what you're saying is that even though you've got neighboring examples, yes. everybody's just, you know, Exactly. It's not happening here, so we're fine. It hasn't happened. There's a little bit. We remember once it happened, but I think people have forgot, and they don't see the risk. It's just so risk like this, right? It increases, increases until some event throws it. Oh, yeah, tipping it's a little point, bit like Miguel yeah. was described, right? Sure. Something, you know, you go from the other side, and then it's huge. Right, right. Do you guys find this also applies to your fields, that risk is being... Uh, um, it's not being accommodated, it's not being really taken into account. Let, let's start by the forest fires. Okay. I mean by the administration or other stakeholders. Okay. Um, I think uh, from the point of view of a forest fire, I think it has a lot of, uh, of news on the newspapers during the, during the summer, so the, the risk and the, the perception is uh, clearly uh, I don't know if this uh, only occurs during the during the summer, mm -hmm. but I think it's uh, it's on the newspaper, it's on the conversation, you know, at least during the during summer. But but do you think? Uh, yeah. But the question was, do you think that politicians or stakeholders are considering risks in in a way that you would deem adequate? Meaning, it's not just. The, the, there's a fire, we need to pour more money into that and then 
when fall comes or when winter is due, we don't care about that. And perhaps we should be, uh, should be a 360 uh, issue. I think the, the implication of politician, I think, is, is very linked to, to the, to the, um, to the season. I, it's not, uh, I, I'm not sure if they are really, um, uh, they are all really uh, aware about the, 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 the real problem. I think it's uh, more linked with uh, uh, other interests than, uh, I'm not, sometimes I have this, uh, this perception. It's uh, just uh, something uh, that it's occurring in, in a period of time, but it's not, uh, right. uh, I don't know, really do, do, I don't know. Okay, so let me open a question for everyone here. Um, do you think that that is, uh, I need to rephrase, how much of the responsibility do you think researchers have in conveying that information, in doing outreach, so that these stakeholders, be they politicians or whatever, take you know a different stance, uh, so care more, <laughs> make better decisions. Do you think researchers must do that or you're fine with producing science? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a responsibility for, for researchers. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> it's one of our responsibility. Right. Uh, but uh, I think we need uh, also the uh, 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 technician, uh, people specialized uh, to help us to, 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 to transmit this, our information to the way of uh, people and politicians and all the stakeholders we able to or will be able to, to connect with uh, the stakeholders. I, I think not uh, only the science, maybe not the, all the science are good uh, connected with uh, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone are able to produce good information, good data but not uh, able to, 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 to connect uh, this, uh, this information with the stakeholder. Mm -hmm. Clara wanted to say something. Yes, because, so it's a little bit like a wrong thing, right? Okay. In my institute, we cannot work in whatever we want. We have to work in things that we have, we got uh, funded for. So our salary comes sure. from projects. No, but it's different from the, from the university, right? So the university, you have a salary, and you, know, you can basically do whatever you want as far as you find the money to do it somewhere. But I have to, my salary comes from projects. If there is money for um, risk analysis, for studying risk, then I get to, to study that. Mm -hmm. If uh, uh, the government or whoever gets, uh, gives funding is interested in uh, projections of carbon uptake for via biofuel, blah, 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 that's what I'm gonna do because there is no funding for analysis of barbiturate attacks because, I don't know, in Norway, for example, because they are not interested. But now, for example, there is a change, right? So there is money because they're interested because somehow they got um, aware of the risk or they start to worry about things and then there is funding so like, then I can do it, then I can produce data and results that can go into society to say, well, climate change is gonna increase our risk and it's gonna happen what happened to Sweden and it's gonna happen what happens to mm -hmm. Germany. Uh, but if I don't have funding, even though I think there is a risk. Right, right. That, that, that is interesting. We, um, let me do a tiny bit. Uh, we at FECIT, we, we uh, manage a thing called the Oficina C, which is a, uh, it's a tiny team so far, uh, but it's a, it's a team of sci scientifically trained. They, 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 I think everyone's got a PhD there, and they produce uh, files um, for the Congress, uh, that are have no policy recommendations, so we don't we don't tell them what to do, but we inform with the best available evidence, uh, national, international, and there's a lot of work uh, into into producing one of those uh, papers, um, so that they can decide. But pretty much like in your situation, we only produce those documents when petitioned, so we we don't get to say what they should be interested in. We, we, we do propose like 20 topics and then they choose and then we inform, right? But it, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky balance. Um, let me ask you th that question in a different form. Um, how much of your time is devoted to outreach? Be, be um, a public talk, like Miguel, you, you were giving a talk just, just now. How much of your time is devoted to do something different than science proper? I mean, producing knowledge. 
I would say that uh, less than we should, but more than we can. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean that uh, I totally agree with you that dissemination is a key part of scientific uh, work. Right. We need to transmit our message, our results, but this is very costly, actually. This takes a lot of time. Sometimes uh, talking about the stakeholders, they don't like what uh, research says, so you have to be very mm, trained in the way you transmit that, and this requires also uh, some skills that we often uh, don't have, so mm -hmm. this is mm, difficult. This is not well valued in the scientific uh, career also, right. uh, as you know, now we have the sexenio de transferencia, this is uh, like a complement of the salary you can get if, uh, if you participate, if you engage in dissemination, but in my institution this is not paid, for example, <laughs> so it's a difficult time, uh, personal relationships also uh, are difficult sometimes. Uh, uh, it's a topic very complicated. Right. Uh, I think that uh, I dedicate more time than most of my colleagues uh, mm -hmm. to, to discuss, to be in contact. But, but since you're painting sort of a, a dark picture, uh, why? <laughs> why do you, do you put so much time and effort? Because we have other things to do, as to teach in the university. No, no, no. What I mean is, why why you do it? So why? There's going to be something I think it's positive. Important. I need, okay. Uh, I need to transmit the the stakeholders, for example, the hunters, that the, that yeah. we we need to know what is happening with the the animals, so that as to manage them properly. We need to to be in contact because they are. Uh, in the field every day, we need mm -hmm. to know the local knowledge. We, as I said, at the be I think at the beginning that the uh, one of the complaints of the game managers was that they were not uh, included in the in the in the research project. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to participate, and this uh, this topic, the cooperation, and I think this is very important. But it, mm. it's really difficult. It's challenging to to reach a real cooperation without many difficulties, with mm -hmm. uh, many time. And as I said, we have uh, talks, we have uh, papers, we have uh, students, we have sure. many other things to do. Sure. And so it's like it's some days I think, well, never. I switch to other stakeholders. I <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move just to. To the field uh, to put the uh, camera traps, and I forget uh, working with people because people are much more complicated than animals. <laughs> so, but uh, Tends my to be personal the case. view is right. that we have to do it. <laughs> right, uh, right. Sure. You should, yes. and, and we, uh, we thank you for yeah. it. Uh, regarding this question, who, who are you? Just briefly. Yes. My name is uh, Fuad Munir professor at the National Forestry School in Morocco. Thank we are you. dealing <coughs> with this uh, problem mainly in the south part of Mediterranean Sea, uh, dealing with this global, um, I, I would like to, 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 to go back to global change, not only climate change, because mm -hmm. <coughs> we do have climate change for sure, but there are also some other uh, factors that are influencing uh, the behavior of our uh, nature. <coughs> Then, uh, regarding the, the last this, this questions, the, the job of scientists, what is the job, the main job of scientists is to raise questions, raise hypotheses, uh, do study, uh, find some results, and then try to disseminate these results to the stake, not only st mainly decision makers. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, what we are discussing now is in this kind, because Already scientists, they raise awareness about climate change. Uh, that is for regions, there are some mini, uh, how to say, COPs are uh, held in. But the problem is the decision makers, are they listening enough the awareness that have been raised? That's the, that's the problem because <laughs> many, okay. many decision makers, uh, they, are also, they take care also only about economic issues. Right. 
And uh, for example, we can give the, the, the example of the United States, uh, uh, Trump, uh, he absolutely don't believe in climate change and he said, oh, uh, <coughs> this, this climate change is some, somehow a big lie, just they want us to uh, shift from our standard of life. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the main that is the problem. Uh, there are many studies that have been raised and many uh, data that gave us uh, the risks, for example, on fire, forest fire. <coughs> In Morocco, we do have a special center of, of, of uh, uh, forest fire. Uh, in which we are dealing each year with forest fire, mainly in North Morocco, and each, each year we are giving uh, data and uh, information about the risk of forest fire. And this can help, can help decision makers mm -hmm. during, for example, within the, the, the regions to put uh, enough means to fight against this. Mm -hmm. Then the decision makers have to take this in consideration. That is, that is the main, in my point of view, it is the main important thing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just before you answer, guys, just one quick question. Have you ever held public office? Have you ever, yeah. Uh, so do, do, do you know what the job of a politician is? Yeah. For real? Yeah, I know. So you've, you've, been, you've been a politician at some point? No, I have never been a politician. So how do you know what, what the job of a politician is? What? How do you know? what the job of a politician is. Not what should be, what is. The job of politician You assume. What? J just checking to, to, to conduct. OK, so you've never been a politician. No, I've never okay. been a politician. OK, good. I'm, I'm a scientist. Right, right, right. right. And of course. Anyone wants to? Maybe I can, because I have an, uh, uh, I also agree that we sh one of our mission is to is to talk about our results because right. that's why we are doing now. We are trying to inform the best we can everyone of right. what is going on in the world. Um, I think we don't do enough. It would be, but as we said, also we mentioned, we don't have the sometimes the, the formation, right. the training, training that. skills, so it's and it's really yeah. hard to reach people that are outside our field because most of the time we are meeting in this kind of meeting, we are all talking about the same topics, we understand each other, but we don't reach the other uh, stakeholders or private owners or whatever. Right. So I think that's a, a challenge, but that, could, that should be a goal too, a, a mission mm -hmm. to accomplish. And then going back to politicians, for example, in our field, um, we are in contact with the Ministry of Ecology and they are asking us to do some, some, some work, and then we go back to them and we report our results. So we have a way, mm -hmm. a communication between the ministry, which mm -hmm. is not always the case, of course. Right. And I think they do probably a better job to go back to stakeholders than, mm -hmm. than we do, because they have the contact and the, right. the facilities right. to do so. Well, it's e easier than, than the Trump situation yes. our colleague mentioned. Uh, before it, that, that's for sure. Uh, so it is interesting because I like to rate. Miguel wants to yes. talk. Please go ahead. Sorry. Only one thing uh, <laughs> related with with this that we need. Uh, in my opinion is that we need uh, uh, trained teams of uh, dissemination. Right. I mean that I work together with hunters, also farmers and conservation NGOs, and these uh, mm, collectives have their own um, dissemination department with mm. five, six, ten or more people. And at my institution and in my research center, there is one people trained for that. We are sure. 40 <laughs> researchers. And it's very difficult to manage many of the things. When we receive a petition for an interview, for example, I, I become scared. Mm. <laughs> what I'm going to say <laughs> now, I don't know. Right. Because I'm not trained. I, I yeah, need yeah. Uh, this support. And right. uh, we don't have this at least at right. the same level than other um, right. actors or collectives. Right. That, that's really interesting because one thing that ties together, I, I wasn't trying to antagonize you. Let, let me explain my question. Um, it is often the case, as Delphine was saying, that scientists, you spend, and, and, and of course, if you are successful in your career, you spend a lot of years 
surrounded by like-minded people, interested in the same things that you are, and your chances of progress depend on publishing oftentimes or producing the, 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 the papers that are asked for, right? Required. Um, that does not train you to deal with the outside world. And just very briefly, a politician, the fitness, <laughs> fitness of a politician is to gain uh, elections, to gain and maintain public office. And that's done by, you know, having votes. And votes are given by people, and people is interested in today, normally. Tomorrow, maybe, but not five, 10 years, 20 years. That's really difficult. So those guys are subjected. They have this fitness um, constriction, if you want. So one of the things that I would throw here to the audience and to you guys is that perhaps you could, um, or what? let me do it as a question. How would you approach this problem if it were a research problem? Meaning you don't have the experience or expertise or the techniques or the, but, but there are people that have it. There are people that are professional lobbyists and, and ad agencies and that, you know, they obtain results, they need money, I know, <laughs> but they obtain results influencing decision makers, politicians. So how, how do you think that from science there's something to be gained or um, co-opted for better goals, I guess, <laughs> from, from that industry that, that you could, because it, it, is, it is really difficult to, to really think, um, especially for those of you who are starting your careers, that you've got to produce the papers, do the science, do the outreach, deal with the politicians. It, that's, that's a high uh, bar. What do you think? Is, is there something to be done there? <laughs> Silence there. Does the audience think something about that, or <laughs> I was well, far well, off the mark? <laughs> very interesting question. Um, I would try to answer. I am not an expert. Sure. But, so basically, I come from Pakistan, and I can see this, this issue almost on a spectrum. Okay. That, for example, our politicians are not at all connected with, with, um, with the problems or real-world problems, whereas I see that in Europe, are much more connected with the um, real world uh, problems. But of course, how I said, it is almost a spectrum. But I feel like this should come from public awareness because this is probably because in our country, uh, the education is very little, uh, very low, the education rate. So um, the awareness is very low, uh, whereas in Europe, the awareness is a, a bit higher, so politicians uh, do make some decisions that are more like um, uh, that are more like informed decisions, let's say, and then they don't make the other decisions. What I feel like is that the politicians are gonna make decisions that are uh, public demand, let's say, or something, an issue that is raised in the public, they are going to make that decision. Uh, because how you said that, they, don't, they want a vote. Mm -hmm. So if we say that we want, we want to see this happen, this will happen. The politicians will be forced to make that decision. So I think a very good uh, idea is to make more awareness uh, in the people. How can we do that? I think there are three types of people. And what we see is that most of the time we see, an extra, like as a scientist, we see most of the time extreme people who know or who don't know. But there is a big part of people who don't know, but they can, be, they can change their opinion if informed like the right way, or how you said that the uh, right communication methods. Uh, I think the goal should be to focus on those people who don't know but, uh, or, or who don't know what to do, but they can be uh, influenced. So, so rather than focusing on a little um, group that is that have very strong opinions and that are never going to change their opinions. Yeah. Thank you. What do you think about it? Then? Yeah. Oh, that, that's very astute. That's very astute. Uh, that's the, the Gauss distribution. You always attack there because you can you can move that in opinion polls. Uh, that's yeah, that's true. Uh, th there was a. Sure. Hi, my name is Frederico Simões. I'm from Brazil. And it's a good showcase, Brazilian, because we came from a right president that was using the, the science to promote uh, and change something for the, the private sector, for the business 
and now they change with the, 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 the president and it's more related to the conservation and this kind of point of view. So as Professor Miguel said, uh, we have uh, not consensus inside of the science, you just show a map with two different results that can be some misinterpretation. And also this uh, happen like if you use the science or if you feel the way you, you show your, your results can make some influence in the, in the politicians. And using, like you said, a lobby, a lo someone to make this connection between science and, and the politicians can be uh, something uh, a bit hard because if he's, for example, in the, in the left or in the right, maybe he's going to use the, the science according to, to the votes. That's oh, sure. what they're looking for. And we should uh, try to find a consensus inside of science, if it's possible, to at least give in one result for the politicians so they can make better laws. Mm -hmm. Could be. What do you think? Yeah, sure. One thing, one thing here is that uh, in some cases, the recommendations of researchers uh, go against the uh, decisions that would uh, give uh, votes to the politicians. As I said, if uh, some politician uh, would ask me or Maria or whatever, uh, whichever in, in research community about what should we do with the deer in national parks, we would say kill them. We need to reduce. We have 40 or 50 deer per ki a square kilometer, we need to reduce this to four or three. You Oof. have to kill many, many deer in a national park. And the culling if is you not do this, popular. then <laughs> the boats will go down. Right. So this uh, balance is really difficult and sometimes because we have to recommend, to recommend what we think that uh, scientifically is necessary, but this it's not going to, to match the, the needs of the politician, of the right. policy maker. So this is very difficult. We have seen now, uh, just now, another example in the new law of uh, animal health that all the people in the research community agree that it's going to reduce biodiversity because it's promoting cat colonies. And everyone in our uh, community knows that feral cats are a real problem for conservation. Mm -hmm. But what people, what happened? That people like to kill to like cats. <laughs> That's, yeah. So <laughs> if you promote the killing of the cats, you are going to go out of the government immediately. Right. So reaching this balance is really complicated in my view. Yeah, but but so but so the the so the government will or the politician will do something that would not challenge too much his or her base. So probably we need to address her base first instead of seduce, persuade. Yeah, this is what I told in my first uh, intervention, that we need to reconnect people to transmit the knowledge. We need to disseminate right. that these cats that are outside right maybe are a problem for conservation and people, we need that people are aware mm -hmm. about these uh, ecological problems and most of them, most of the society are not aware now of the problems because uh, I understand these are really particular problems. No, I can't uh, say to my mother, you need to know that cats are bad, but actually they are for birds, for lizards and so right. it's, uh, we need dissemination and also uh, reconnecting people with nature is my, my view. Yeah, but, uh, Clara, you, you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, but I don't know if, uh, yeah, and, and then we go to the mic. So, the, so I always speak from the point of view of Norway, which is the one I know. And I agree with me on that reconnection, people should reconnect to nature mm -hmm. because if they don't care, they don't know, they are, like, they don't listen, they just are not, it's not in their you know, sure. world of interest. 
And I think that the key is, is to connect to people, to nature. In, in Norway, everybody goes to the forest every weekend. Every mm -hmm. week, they go to the forest. My kids go to the forest every freaking week uh, from school. The school takes them to the forest to teach nature or stuff like that. Right. So they know much more. They are more interested. There is, it is their own thing. Sure. Right? They own it. So, so it's much easier for them to listen than it is for society in, in Spain. Right. And also, it's, it's different to, to speak to stakeholders. or to the. So my institute does the same thing as yours, I guess. We do reports for uh, informing regulations and, mm -hmm. and laws, right? So it's easy to talk to them because we know what we're talking about. And mm -hmm. I think it's easier to, uh, we also work with Forest Owner Association. We do projections for them. We do stuff for them. We have a good, rela a good relationship, right? right. Uh, but, but the rest of the world is... <laughs> right. Right, right, right. Like you said, so should we do something? Should we do a lobby? Like I can talk to forest owners. I can talk to politicians. Yeah. I don't know how to be to, to talk to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're not interested. At least in Spain. Yeah. Right. Right. Like it, it, for forestry news in Norway makes the main the, like the main like El País o El Mundo here, yeah. like the main newspaper yeah. in the country. Here, <laughs> it's difficult. I know. If it's but, if, if it's forest fire, sure. That, that's easy. Right. Sexy. Right. Right. <laughs> But, but I'm, I'm going to the mic in a second. But you know, that there's, a, there's a sort of communications 101 lesson that perhaps is interesting. So it is really difficult to sell the idea of we got to kill cats because people love cats. But so first lesson, never like, you know, Van Gaal would say, never negative, always positive. We need to save birds. That's your message. It's never kill cats. You, you need to sell them on saving Birds. But sorry, it's not difficult if you say that we need to kill rats or mosquitoes. Yeah, because no one. Yeah, yeah, but that's it. So you, so you need to adjust because that's that's yeah. euphoric. That's amazing. But you know, it's yeah, anyhow. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> sorry, there was a mic there. I want to to stress that politicians are not so different as as we are because always we tend to say that politicians are others. Mostly with bad, they are bad people or people trying to, to get the fitness as best as they can. And not always is in that way, but I, in my experience, one of the problems is about the normal people, the society, don't know how, we, how is science or what to, you can expect from science or what you cannot expect from science. In that way, politicians, officers, technical, Normal people are scientists to confirm the choices or the belief. If you don't agree with the previous ideas, you are discarded. Okay, you are not on the line. And then they keep in their own ideas, keeping I have with the good scientists that say, that say whatever I, I want to, to hear. And the other that say other things or express doubt about the data or publication, because always we are controversial in the results, are bad scientists or not good enough, not like our supporter. And I think that this partisan use of the science is one of the problems. Not only that we are not able to reach the, the people, also that the education about that, what is science. I, I, I don't tell him that people doesn't know, normally they don't know about relative or about natural witness. They don't know about what they can expect from science. I think this is a problem. That's true. That's absolutely true. Um, yeah, sadly, that's true. What is what they can expect from science? Exactly. It's a question. <laughs> in, 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 like in a tweet version. Uh, we can expect that science challenges ourselves. So the problem is that oh, pe we... People don't like being challenged. Come on. No, but, <laughs> but people, people, like people have to know that uh, science always is a tentative understanding of the reality. All right. It's the things that we can say now. Maybe in 10 years, ourselves, myself, can change of the idea because we have new right. results. Right. But normal people have fixed idea. This is true. Cats are bad. That's all. And it will be forever. Or not. Forever is too long. So maybe our history, our current situation, things that this is happening, and this is the things that we as scientists can advise. Save birds. Don't kill cats, but save, save birds. But maybe in 10 years, the population of cats declined dramatically, and we have to save the cats. 
I don't know. It's just an idea. Science has to be able to change the idea. Mm -hmm. And we have to recognize that we have now, with our data, with our knowledge, our situation, we can propose that ideas. But it doesn't problem if two years later the same people come back with different ideas. Mm -hmm. I, I know that it's difficult for us and for other people to understand that. But if the people know what is science, and what is the origin of the results, I think this will be easier to engage with the politician or even right. with officers. Most of the time are not really politicians doing law, are only officers doing regular managerial work and they, ne they need something to, to support the decision. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add something to that? <laughs> be, be, be clear that you don't hate cats. That's, <laughs> no one's against cats here today. <laughs> see, see, it's interesting what you're saying, because uh, if, if we go to the work of, do you guys know who Danny Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman is? Anyone? For instance, he's the author of Thinking Fast and Slow. He's also a, a Nobel Prize winner for economics, although he's a psychologist. He was the first guy to be awarded a, a non-economist to be awarded a, an economics Nobel Prize for a work that he developed uh, studying in the late 60s and 70s with a partner, uh, Amos Tversky, who sadly died before, so he couldn't get the, the award. Um, um, I, I'm quoting him because there's something that he says in that book he mentioned, Thinking Fast and Slow, but it comes from the previous papers, which is very good. But he, he participated in a 20... 12th conference in, in Washington, D.C. that was titled uh, The Science of Science Communication. Uh, and, and so it assumed that gathering a bunch of scientists together uh, would be able to solve once and for all the problem of science communication, right? And so, and, and let's change chapter. Um, and this guy went onto the podium and the microphone and said something that was uh, not well received. Uh, that was, it doesn't matter how many papers, how much data you have, it doesn't matter if all the scientists agree on uh, solution A or B. What it really matters when you want to persuade somebody is that you tell a story that's coherent and it's emotionally coherent, not data, not coherent as in rational, no, 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 emotional coherent and that you are likable. Those are the two factors, and for this, they don't give you professorship anywhere. <laughs> but that's what matters when you want to do outreach in a persuasive way. Um, so it is true that it would be great to uh, have the public think as a scientist, but it ain't gonna happen anytime soon, I'm afraid. So perhaps you guys should think, I don't know how to implement it, how to tell emotionally coherent stories and be likable. Not that you're not. <laughs> the whole killing cats, it's problematic. <laughs> but, but, but you get the gist of my, my thing. There was a mic here, right? No, no, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Hello. Uh, what I was wondering is that it's also a question of methodology. We are using science of uh, regarding, well, saying as far as I know in this moment, and uh, to be in the nuance and uh, the publicity and the, the short messages, you have to kill cats or you don't have to kill cats. There are short messages in which the nuance is not possible. So I think that we also have to, to introduce in society more of the scientific methodology to think again on the objective, on the methodology and uh, to think about uh, what do we know now to review or, or principles mm -hmm. and uh, to start again. And that's not very common because we believe one thing and we look for data that supports or previously decided decision. Con confirmation bias. So introducing in society the fact that we can review again and again or beliefs or, or values and so many other things that uh, Miguel was telling in the first, mm -hmm. well, in the introduction conference. I think that's a, one of the points that we have to look at. Mm -hmm. 
that would be interesting. Uh, what would you say, because, Clara, you wanted to say something? Uh, sure. Yeah, so I, I, uh, that's uh, my wish list. I mean, like, if, if I wish that that would, that would work, like uh, teaching people or le people should learn how to understand uh, science, right? But I, I vote more for feelings and coherent things and forest fires. I mean, you say forest fires and people get really, like... Yeah, they pay attention. Things. Yes, at least in the summer, right? Yeah. So that's, but we are really bad at that because science is everything about stripping feelings and being neutral and very scientific. So for me, it's like if I have one hat, I cannot have the other. It's like when I'm writing and coding. If I'm good at coding, my brain just shut up and I speak like a robot. If I'm writing, then I can code. Right. Uh, is in a way, if I write papers, I cannot talk to people. <laughs> uh, you know what? Like yeah, yeah. in that way. Uh, and then I guess that mean, needs training, but we don't have the training. Oh yeah. And it, it doesn't pay off. It that, doesn't pay off. That's it. Uh, personally. Okay, personally. So, okay. So let me pose this to you. Um, I should have had it here, uh, but I can send to you. It is a plus one, so you can criticize me. It's not a science, not a cell, not a nature paper. Although, uh, I do have a favorite paper that positively correlates the impact, the citations of a paper uh, with his uh, narrative proficiency or, or index. So the better written, the, the more persuasive it's a scientific paper, the better citations it has, it could have. Again, it's, it's not a science, but it makes kind of intuitive sense if you think about it. I've been for many years a, a, a teacher in, in communications, and one of the things that I would always say to scientists is that it's not to do outreach. It's not to do the beer for science thing that you guys do here. It's not just to be cute and nice and tell people about the wonderful things that science can give you. Uh, it is actually that you're in a meeting such as this, and if you communicate better, you make better acquaintances, better partners for future papers, uh, you're better at fundraising or grant writing or so it actually pays off scientifically I believe um, Of course the more if, if you're in a competitive uh, uh, surrounding right a system that actually uh, puts a prize on uh, Being persuasive, but but I do think that science has to be persuasive actually if you if you travel back in time uh, if you if you uh, read science from the early 1900s uh, there was a lot of I in the papers. You've been surgically removed now, but science used to be written in the first person, which I, I know you, you, you shouldn't do that now because you don't get published, but you get the gist. You still can be a, 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 have a leading, leading role, I, I believe. Anyhow, anybody else? Sure. Uh, uh, just give me a second. Uh, um, Mercedes, and, and then the mic. You, you wanted to say something, and I was okay. slow. Just, just uh, one question. When I think we are speaking about the society when we are, we are thinking about adult, adults, but the society is also children that will be the, the society, the adult society in the future. So I think uh, uh, we, a researcher can have an important role in yeah. uh, con uh, convincing uh, young people. Right, right, right. It, it's a so necessary but not sufficient condition. <laughs> That, right. But not just uh, thinking on, on politician or society as adults, uh, people who read uh, El País. Or, or, right. Okay, so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, yeah. Almost nobody <laughs> reads the newspapers today. <laughs> so, yeah. Addressing El País readership is probably not a good uh, strategy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So no one today maybe. Uh, oh, who are you? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. No one's today, maybe uh, we don't read newspaper, etc. but they need... Introduce that. yourself. Who are you? Oh, I'm Lucrezia, and I'm a medical student for the first year. I'm here for the winter school. Thank you. Okay, so uh, maybe people uh, nowadays don't read too much newspaper, but they still to get information. So maybe we need to change uh, our... Uh, uh, our uh, way to communicate. But the thing that I would like to say, it's a question. Do we really think that uh, uh, convinced people in killing cats uh, or uh, killing deer uh, will, uh, will solve the problem of biodiversity conservation? Maybe 
it's the time that uh, we uh, need to think uh, about uh, global change and all of the consequences uh, as a, a, a system problem, uh, like a, a socio-economic problem. And uh, maybe we need to abandon the, uh, the idea that science needs to be neutral. Maybe if we want to have uh, a change in our world, if we, if we really want to conserve nature, maybe it's the time that science needs to take uh, a decision and uh, raise its voice also in uh, political action and et cetera. It's a question mm -hmm. to all of you. Okay, the first thing I want to say is that that of killing cats or <laughs> ungulates <laughs> is just an example, a very particular example of yeah. a particular conservation problem. <laughs> if I go back to my presentation, my first slide showed uh, that the big problem, the big challenge is that we are too many. That we are too many people. And this has many repercussions, also the way of life, and this has uh, a more global <laughs> problem that is uh, or that mm, drives all the small problems. Is what I, Miguel, this this easily would segue sorry. into killing people. Uh, do you really <laughs> want to go there? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I agree also with Mercedes that at least yes. in here one of the one of the options would be uh, working in the basic education, at least to reconnect people with nature. We need to, to start in the early stage of life. Uh, uh, for example, my, my daughter went to the King Garden and they, they were learned that they, they had a pet. Uh, they need to, to take the pets at home, just to sleep with the pets. With, well, there are some solutions, there are some management solutions that require reducing the number of animals. This is what scientists say. I'm not against of killing the air. <laughs> I know the problem and but I what, agree what I you. say that the model, and uh, as, uh, as said Clara also about Norway, is uh, changing our way of life in many, in many ways. Uh, for example, going to the forest. Uh, I live in a relatively small city and I don't know many people who go to the forest with the kids, which is very usual in Norway. So we need to be in contact with nature. We need to know uh, this is a tree. We can take uh, apples from the tree and not for the supermarket. First time that my uh, the kids of my of my cousin came to the to the village where we spent the summer in in northern Burgos. They saw the apples the apples in the trees and they got what was that? <laughs> apples are in the supermarket, not in the trees. So this is not good for us. Not good for us for management for policymakers for global chain. It's the level of this connection of nature that affects every decision, every support to decision making and everything. Sorry. Can I reply? Hello. And, hello, hello. Uh, you had uh, before uh, Clara, right, had, had said that, but also you have said that uh, uh, you don't have the, the money to go and educate people. Because you can't dedicate uh, uh, the time that you would like to uh, in uh, the education of people. So uh, I think that uh, based on this statement, uh, it's not possible to think that science uh, has to educate people. Because you don't have the time to do it. So maybe. We, can, we have to address the message to the institution to another level. <sighs> and also, sorry, I 
would like to say a, a thing that uh, I believe that it's not fair to uh, say that we are too much in this world. Because I think that we are all aware about the concept of uh, global footprint. Uh, and we all know how much research consume the style of life uh, of uh, the western part uh, of the world. That is the one that has uh, less people. So I think that it's really not fair to speak about, uh, uh, to uh, say that we are too much in this world. I don't know if I, if I was clear <laughs> yeah, about so that. It's a very complex discussion. Uh, there are many Sorry. things. Uh, yeah, you have, for example, the environmental justice. You can discuss a lot about this. I, I'm not an expert in this. <laughs> anymore and this is the reason why I'm, I have been talking about uh, very simplistic examples but I agree, totally agree with you that the topic is much more complicated, that the solutions, as I said, only for wildlife are not unique. We need to work at multiple levels, at multiple scales and in this regard I agree with Felipe that it, the problem is not only uh, with policy makers, with officers, not only with society, with stakeholders. It's a multi-scale and multi-functional problem <laughs> and very difficult. Uh, I agree. I cannot say any other thing, sorry. There's something I would say. You suggested uh, either perhaps it's the time to start being uh, science activists or, or activist scientists. Um, beware of losing the will of objectivity because when you lose it, then you're just another interest group. We can do a conversation about the meaning of objectivity. No, no, no. I, 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 <laughs> I, I know, I know, no, no. We, we, we could delve into the depths of uh, philosophy of science, which is fine. What I mean is that as a group, the only thing that differentiates you from a church is that you say that you work in an objective science. I know that we can discuss and we cannot agree a lot of stuff, but from the time you start being a, an activist, then you're just another one. And, and the scientist is, uh, advising Bolsonaro is, do or you Trump. Think that objectivity will save the world. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just saying that. So, so you can, so you can, you can uh, compartmentalize the job. You can produce science that is used by groups that have different aims or different ways of uh, working or attaining their uh, goals. If if you put that that methodology into science, you get a problem with science. And then you, you're not respectable anymore as scientists. So, so the guy, probably you know guys who have become activists. They're not as respected anymore for good reasons, I believe, as scientists. Um, well, I'm a postdoc at the University of Valladolid. Um, I live in Soria, which is smaller than Valencia, no? I think. <laughs> and, and my son the other day came to, to my home and he, he's uh, five and a half. And he told me that we cannot cut um, wood, so trees. We cannot cut trees because we have to um, conserve the forest. And as a forester, I was like shocked, like, okay, what is going on? So, and, and he, he goes to a school in a sm really sm a small town, so he's looking the cows every day. So he's really involved in the, in the countryside. So, um, so my thought is that, uh, as you were saying, that we have to be more involved in, the, um, uh, in changing the messages, not only to politicians, but, uh, but also to, to small kids in school. So maybe I cannot talk to the councilman in Soria, but they can go to the school and say, hey guys, we can use, of course we can use wood because mm -hmm. it's a, you know, um, 
renewable resource. Yeah, thank you. A sustainable is much, much better than, than concrete, and mm -hmm. it's, you can cut it and it grows again. So we should use it in a. So, I mean, uh, we have to change the method, and we can, in the small uh, part that you can do, I think that we should do it. So, right. thank you for the message. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been warned. We're like way out of time. Um, luckily enough, there's lunch now, so we can go on with. It's got to wait until lunch. Sorry, I, I've been warned two times already. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm okay. way out of line here. Um, so, so thank you very much for all the panelists, and thank you for your thank you. attention. <laughs> this, thank you.